Welcome everyone to another edition to As Above, So Below Radio. I'm your host, Martin Hodgson, and it gives me great pleasure to have you tuning in today. When you get a chance, please visit the website holisticadvocate.com and sign up for a free newsletter. Also, take a moment to subscribe and become a member. You'll not only gain access to our commercial-free subscriber-based interviews, but also treat yourself to an assortment of fascinating people worth listening to. Today's guest is Lucy Pringle. Lucy is an international authority on crop circles as well as a pioneer researcher into the effects of electromagnetic fields on living systems. Besides her dedication to this phenomenon, she also writes, appears on TV, and broadcasts extensively on this subject. She's also an aerial photographer, an author, a lecturer, as well as a contributing writer to various publications. Join me in welcoming Lucy as she discusses the crop circle phenomenon. Okay, Lucy, first of all, I want to give you a nice warm welcome to you for being on As Above, So Below Radio. Uh, so for any of our listeners who are just tuning in, uh, can you just give a brief background about yourself and what got you started into exploring the fascinating phenomenon of crop circles? Um, I've been investigating this phenomenon now for very nearly 25 years. And that takes us back to the, really to the early days of when the phenomenon first came to uh, the public interest, if you like. I mean, it goes back. It goes back to uh, 1678 when we had the, the mowing devil, mm-hmm. uh, which, is a, which is a curious story of uh, a farmer who had a field of oats in Hertfordshire, which in England, that's a county mm-hmm. in England, and uh, he had a field of oats that was ready to be harvested. So he called in somebody to, to harvest his, uh, his field, and he was going to charge, the story goes, he was going to charge the farmer such an exorbitant amount of money that the farmer was heard to say, no, he would rather the devil took his oats, and that is why it's called the mowing devil. Mm-hmm. It's depicted as uh, a woodcut. So the farmer went away that uh, evening, and apparently during the night, strange sounds were heard, and strange sights were seen. And this goes back very much to what is happening in the fields today, because very often when um, a crop circle appears, you will find lights, we call them luminosities, Mm -hmm. in the sky, hovering over a certain patch in the field or part in a field. And if you go into that field the next day, you may very well find a crop circle beneath where you saw the light during the night. Mm -hmm. Well, the farmer went back the next day and he found part of his uh, field laid down in round circles, and apparently he was terrified, poor man, and he took to his heels and he fled. But um, clearly that was, of, that was of significance because it, uh, it was recorded, and uh, that record was passed down to us through the ages. Mm-hmm. And when I wrote, wrote my first book, Crop Circles, The Greatest Mystery of Modern Times, I investigated, and I was able to go back and actually speak to people who had lived in the early 20th century. They're probably dead now. But they remember as children playing in these things in the fields. And they used to have great fun. So they are a a natural phenomenon, if you like. But uh, to answer your question, I came into the phenomenon in the late 1980s, and I was a member of a foundation member of the first academic society, which was called the Center for Crop Circle Studies. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that uh, is no longer. Um, It was a very good society. It was a mixture of people, scientists, uh, sincere investigators, dowsers, chandlers, all mixed up of people. 
Um, I came in as a dowser, and that is, uh, I don't know if people know that, I'm sure most people do understand, that's when you, you douse for maybe for water or for oil, but you can really douse for anything at all, mm -hmm. um, and you can use any instrument. I've sometimes had to use my handbag as a, as a diving tool if, I, if I'd left my rods or my pendulums behind. And say somebody has got an, a nut allergy, mm -hmm. if they take their pendulum into <coughs> the supermarket and they look over biscuits or whatever might contain nuts and ask the simple question, does this contain nuts of any sort? then their pendulum will give you an answer. So it's, it's used for many, many different things. It's an invaluable tool. Interesting. But, but um, my first uh, ex uh, experience was in early 1990, and it was going to be my very first flight over the crop circles, and I can't tell you how excited I was. And I'd been playing a game of tennis the evening before. It was a pretty fierce game of tennis. It was a mixed double, doubles. And um, I'd been standing at the net when one of the opposition hit a very, very hard ball at me, and I got it back, but I really jarred my shoulder very badly in doing so. Uh, so badly, in fact, that night when I was trying to clean my teeth, I couldn't actually lift my right arm in order to clean my teeth. So the following morning, it was with a certain amount of dread that I woke up and I tested my arm. Well, it wasn't good, but I got a, a gear lever car and I could shift the gears with my left, ha uh, left hand, so I just really had to guide the steering wheel with my right. And I got to the um, airfield and we set off and it was wonderfully exciting. I, I was never, if you've never, never done it, it's a thing you must do. You must fly over the circles because you see them in, in a figurative form as opposed to just abstract on the ground where you're walking down straight lines or you're going around curves in the crop. You're actually seeing it from the whole, whole shape and it, it takes on quite a different aspect. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the year of the first pictogram at Alton Barnes and this set the whole world alight. I can't tell you how many people visited it, and the owner of the farm uh, was able to collect enough money to re-roof their parish church, their village church. So the money went to very, very good use uh, from all the people visiting it. Well, I can tell you, it was so wonderful that I forgot all about my uh, damaged shoulder, and it wasn't until... Uh, I was driving home with my sister and another friend that I realized I was in quite a bit of trouble. And we just happened to pass uh, a small circle in Morstead, and that's in Hampshire. Uh, luckily, I knew the owner of the field, so I knew there wouldn't be any trouble going in. And I had my pendulum with me, and I doused for the area of the strongest energy. When I found this, I sat down, and to my absolute amazement, when I lifted my right arm, there was absolutely no pain whatsoever. And just before this happened, there seemed to be what I can describe as a current of energy running through one shoulder to the other shoulder. And that was why I thought, well, I wonder what has happened to my right uh, arm, whether I can lift it up, and yes, you know, and behold, I could. And to all intents and purposes, it was healed. Hmm. So I called to um, a friend of mine uh, who had a very nasty condition called systemic scleroderma, which has um, all sorts of... Um, side effects, rather nasty side effects, and I called to her and I said, Maggie, come and sit here, but I was very reluctant uh, to tell her what had happened to me, just in case absolutely nothing happened to her and she might be disappointed. So the moment she sat down, she said, oh, I feel wonderful, I feel really wonderful, I'd like to stay here for the rest of my life. Well, I, I had dowsing and measuring up to do, so off I went. 
And I suppose I was away for about 20 minutes, something mm -hmm. like that. And when I came back, there she was lying flat on her back. Mm -hmm. And she said, look at me. Well, I had completely forgotten that she hadn't been able to lie flat on her back for 15 years due to this being one of the scientific, uh, the um, uh, uh, sideline effects of systemic scleroderma. And I suddenly realized this, and I, I said, this is absolutely astounding. Well, she couldn't believe it either. And so this was something that really hit me very hard. Both Maggie and I had gone in, um, not expecting anything to happen at all, and yet quite independently, something very dramatic had happened. And so it was this incident that set me off on my journey of investigation, if you like, which has kept me, kept me riveted and to this subject ever since. What I'm based on, I basically I'm doing is looking into the effects of electromagnetic fields on living systems. Mm -hmm. Now, that means you and me, and it also uh, means animals. And it was at that point that I thought, right, research has been done measuring the formations and uh, germinating the seeds, but this area of research has been completely untouched. And I developed a questionnaire with, with Maggie's help because she was very computer literate at that time. <laughs> I wasn't since then. I'm, I'm now very computer literate. And she devised um, a computer-friendly uh, questionnaire, which I, I gave out. And over the years, I have been sent well over 800 reports. In fact, I have the largest database in the world on this particular as aspect of research. Mm. It's a very, very valuable uh, database. Yeah. Um, I've, it's, I've put it into categories. I went up to the Royal School of Medicine with a colleague of mine, scientific colleague, and we put the effects into categories. And I, I just like to thank all the people who take the trouble to fill in these um, uh, questionnaires for me. They're quite long, but every single question has a real purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. And it all leads to um, uh, improving and developing my research. Interesting. Now, you also own a website called uh, lucypringle.co.uk. And, of course, you mentioned that you've written a book. You've written two other books, too, right? I've written three books, yeah. Three books so far. And I'm in the middle of the fourth book. That's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> now, you've also published a uh, book of cartoons called uh, Paranormal Pranks. And um, I want to also mention to the listeners out there, you're also a photographer. So oh, yes. <clears throat> you're pretty much a Renaissance woman, so to speak. Well, I think in this, this field of research, you've got to be multifaceted, if you like. You've got to be able to take on different roles and have different abilities. Each one of the various things that I do are interrelated one to the other. Mm -hmm. My photography is absolutely vital in providing me with photographs for my lectures, photographs for my um, articles, photographs for the books that I write, and also for actually trying to fund uh, this research um, because I, I am self-funded and yes. always in desperate need of mm -hmm. money in order to continue this research. And if I can sell photographs and I can sell the goods on my website, this is really what keeps me going. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, I couldn't keep going at all. And sometimes I think, goodness, I'm going to run out completely. So that is why I put out pleas for help. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I, I'd like to put out a plea for help now because, mm -hmm. um, well, we'll talk about my research later on. And, right. and I, I don't want to have to give that up. Surely. Now, you've also uh, produced beautiful calendars, I have to say. The photos are stunningly beautiful, uh, the crop circles and so forth. Now, would you make the comparison that the glyphs 
<clears throat> are somewhat synonymous to ice crystals and that no two appear to be identical. Oh, well, that is absolutely true. Um, even though I think, um, just going on latest statistics, um, crop circles have appeared in 65 different countries of the world. Uh, therefore, it is a worldwide phenomenon. There's a wonderful man called Berthold Zugelda. If you look him up on the internet, Berthold, B-E-R-T-O-L-D, mm -hmm. Zugelda, Z-U-G-E-L-D-E-R, he has the best archive of anybody. Um, and he sent me his um, latest data, and up to the end of 2012, we had 6,200 and something, or 6,300 and something uh, crop circles. So uh, this, this area of research is, is, is very important. And my, I suppose my, my photographic library is the most comprehensive UK photographic library in the world. Interesting. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Lucy, if anyone who really has any, um, uh, any, <clears throat> excuse me, resentment, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a frog in my throat here, for anyone who really doesn't really want to accept the idea that these crop circles are being in fact created by a higher intelligence and that they are being created by let's say hoaxers what is your response to that well i think many people come to this phenomenon and they are rather frightened by it particularly men i have to say apologies to you because um, somehow men find it more difficult to take on board something where there is no explanation. Whereas women, uh, we, we, we are very, very open-minded, very broad-minded, and there are many things in life that we don't understand, and the fact that this is just another of them, that is perfectly fine with us. But I have to say there are man-made circles, so this is absolutely no doubt whatsoever. Uh, due to my scientific work and scientific work by other people, uh, there are definitely circles for which there could be absolutely no human involvement whatsoever. And uh, this is where the important uh, part lies. Just like if there was only one black swan, uh, black swans exist. Um, so uh, there have been over the years, oh, many, 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 many ones that I say there could have been no human involvement whatsoever. And what was absolutely fascinating, I think it was in the year 2000, the millennium, I may be quite wrong on this, but we had a year when we had terrible foot and mouth disease, and it was simply ghastly. Mm -hmm. uh, sheep had to be slaughtered, cows had to be slaughtered, or oh, it was just dreadful. Uh, who anybody, anybody who loves the countryside and the farmland and everything, it was it was a simply terrible situation. Right. And in order to um, protect the areas which were free of foot and mouth, uh, many many fields were actually fenced off, were banned. People couldn't go into the fields, and if they did, there would be huge fines, I mean thousands of pounds, because to, to uh, carry their carrier of foot and mouth, which you know human beings crawl on the sole of their feet, was a terrible crime. Um, so this was extraordinary, an awful lot of the fields in Hampshire and a lot of the fields in Wiltshire, where most of the crop circles appear, uh, the fields were actually cordoned off. And yet, we had more crop circles that year than we had done before. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what is your scholarly interpretation of these crop circles? I mean, you've done research for many, many years, and, you know, people have different opinions as to what they actually are. Some people uh, indicate that they're um, a language. Others indicate that they're mathematical symbols. Um, 
some people claim that um, it's a, a message that's um, indicating uh, possible or imminent contact by um, extraterrestrials. What is your scholarly interpretation of these crop circles, Lucy? <laughs> I don't think I really have one. Mm-hmm. Because, you see, this is a wonderful phenomenon. It's open to everybody's interpretation, mm-hmm. whether they're a chemist or a biologist or a theosophist or, or um, um, a mathematician or a mm-hmm. musician or somebody who's interested in ancient cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's open to or a philosopher. It's open to absolutely every um, area of knowledge, every school of knowledge, and and this is why it is such a huge, huge subject. And and to be absolutely honest, I've learned more in the last twenty five years than I've ever learned ever before mm-hmm. because I find myself investigating areas that I've never investigated before. For instance, my last book. Uh, art, uh, crop circles, art in the landscape, mm-hmm. which is an absolutely beautiful uh, coffee table book of my photographs. Well, the publishers who asked me to do this, who wanted to do this, uh, they weren't happy with science. They couldn't get their minds around the science. Mm-hmm. So I suddenly had a brainwave. What about history of art? Mm-hmm. And they could cope with that. So I suddenly found myself. Uh, linking them to many different artists, and you know, Leonardo da Vinci from the mathematical ones, and going back even into to modern art, and it was a most fascinating area of research. And and this is what happens. And suddenly I find one which which is musical, and suddenly so I'm looking into the music, or I'm looking into one which has theosophical uh, aspects to it, or mathematical. Mm-hmm. And so you find that you're developing your your well of knowledge um, as you as you go along. That is, if you're sufficiently interested uh, to do so. But if we talk about the mathematical ones, we have some really quite uh, extraordinary ones. There was one, I think, in 2009, which appeared at Barbary Castle, and a man called Mike Reed. Um, he telephoned me, well, he, he wrote me an email, and he had really absolutely uh, bulletproof uh, credentials. He, um, he was a retired astrophysicist uh, who had worked at the University of Arizona in, in Tucson on the multi-mirror telescope, which is MMT, mm-hmm. and uh, that was at Mount Hopkins. And this was a joint venture with the Harvard-Smithsonian Observatory. And he reckoned that this particular crop circle was pi to the power of nine. Now, pi is something we all did at school, and it's a, it's a mathematical constant that represents the ratio of any circle's circumference to its diameter. And this was a most extraordinarily profound uh, crop circle and he, he sent me all the details and in fact I managed to get it into the world press. Uh, this was something which there could be no other interpretation. Several of the uh, crop circles, they're open to various aspects of interpretation. Mm-hmm. This one could have no other possible explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, then two years ago there was one which uh, was so similar to Lawrence Euler's uh, theorem. Now, Lawrence Euler was uh, a mathemat- mathematician of huge distinction. And whereas a lot of us see, uh, if you're a photographer, you might see um, everything through the lens of your camera as you're walking along. This is how you view it, even though you're not looking through the lens mm-hmm. of your camera, you're seeing it as though you are. Mm-hmm. Or somebody who's interested in the theater might just be looking at the costumes or might be looking at this. This is how they see life. And Lawrence Euler saw everything as numbers, right from the time he was a child. For instance, if he'd been ca- casting a rod at fishing, he would have noticed the angle of his rod as he cast out. And he developed a theorem well, it was so complex that I think many people said Lawrence Euler himself was the only person who really understood his theorem. 
But uh, he um, he developed this, and his theorem, uh, with the very slightest um, alterations, actually appeared in the field. So this was another of huge complexity, and again, one which could really only have one interpretation. Also, it was likened, so there were several other interpretations to this, because it was likened to the organ alphabet. Now, that was supposed to have been uh, originated in Mesopotamia, in, in mid-European mid, uh, countries, and it was a mixture of verticals and horizontal lines. Also in uh, Ireland, these were found, and they were find, find etched into stones. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have been etched into wood, but of course the wood would have, um, have um, rotted away, but the, the, the alphabet that is still present in, in stones. <laughs> so here we are, we're investigating a huge amount of math, and indeed we can go even further back. There is a wonderful temple in Turkey called the Gobekli Tepe temple. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, it goes back 9,000 years, which takes us to just 1,000 years after the end of the last ice age. Mm -hmm. And yet the mass and the beautiful carving on the stones are really of the highest, highest quality. And this is the time when supposedly people didn't have tools. And also, in the mathematics in this temple, you're getting pi and phi, and these are also the mathematics that you're finding in the genuine crop circles of today. So, what I'm really saying is that we have the advanced mathematics uh, in the crop circles that were present 9,000 years ago. That's very interesting. Now... I heard of accounts where um when wherever there is any uh, cited reference of a um let's just say a UFO uh that somehow the military tends to gather around that area to fend off any civilians with the uh creation of any crop circles have you yourself encountered any unusual military or government personnel around these crop circles? Um, or have you ever seen any um, any uh, planes bring any aerosols into the air? I'm thinking in the line of chemtrails around crop circles to deter people from visiting these crop circles. No, no, I haven't. I have absolutely not. There have been people who have felt as though they have been targeted mm -hmm. um, by helicopters, black helicopters in, in the field, in a particular <laughs> field, I have to say, and that's Eastfield at Alton Barnes near Marlborough in Wiltshire. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been an awful lot of talk about this, um, but I have to say that on close examination and investigation, I discovered that this was a natural flight path Mm -hmm. path of the military when they're training. Mm -hmm. And often they do low-flying uh, practice and target practice, so to speak, when they're flying. Low-flying target practice so that they can actually fly very low over a certain, certain area and maybe even over, well, they shouldn't do it over people. If they do it over people, they really should not be allowed to do it. Um, I suppose if you're military, maybe maybe you can break the rules. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that anybody, despite what certain people have said, I don't think anybody has been targeted <coughs> uh, maliciously or malevolently. Right. Okay. Now, um, I'm pretty certain that you're somewhat familiar with the research of Masaru Emoto. He had written a book called <laughs> The Hidden Messages of Water. And I do believe that you also have experimented with placing bottled bottled water in the vicinity of these crop circles. Now, my question is here, has anyone made any experiments where people randomly have been healed by drinking the water placed within the vicinity of these crop circles? Uh, that's not to my knowledge. And 
I'm always a little hesitant on this one, because I've been doing so much work with water. People have suggested to me that maybe I should take the grain from inside my surface and instill it using a homeopathic uh, method. But mm. as the crop circles seem to have varying effects on people, some people might feel very well, mm -hmm. other people might not feel so well. It all depends on my metabolism. Right. I don't think that would be um, a, a scientific um, area of research that is valid. Okay. Uh, I think on all accounts, one has to be very, very careful mm -hmm. to be very valid about whatever you write. Now, that's why in my articles I go into maybe what seems to be the laborious detail. Mm -hmm. um, and well, let's, let's just talk about this uh, for a moment. Sure. He, his work seems to be absolutely fantastic, and in fact, he's become very famous. Now, a good friend of mine in Holland, she uh, very generously asked, well, suggested that she would sponsor me to send some of my bottles that I had buried inside and in control samples outside to uh, Alopia to be analyzed. Well, all I can tell you was that he was going to charge me 2,000 pounds per bottle and that is what, about $3,500 per bottle to analyze. And as I normally vary between uh, six inside and two control samples outside, that would be eight. So we're going into 24000 well over $25,000 wow. just to do one formation. On top of that, he would retain a uh, copyright of all my work, all my bottles, and if I wanted to use them for a lecture, he would charge me. Mm. Well, I mean, that was absolutely incredible. And also, another thing, I was talking to very far, and I said, his work is absolutely amazing, but he has never had any reviews. Now, when you do work, the way I do my bottles, I make a very, very plain. Everybody can read up my methodology. And if anybody wants to copy my methodology, I would be absolutely delighted. Now, uh, a motor's methodology is never revealed. And so we absolutely have no idea. His work hasn't been replicated by anybody. And we don't know if he's just selecting images randomly. We, we just don't know. Randomly or selectively. We have absolutely no idea at all. And this is where you've got to be very careful with science. And I think Rupert Sheldrake was talking about it the other day. You have to have a proper basis for your work which mm -hmm. is able to be reviewed. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm detecting a little bit of interference with the connection here, but um, we'll just carry on here uh, in the course in the, with the course of the conversation here. I'd like to ask you: um, Have you yourself see, ever had the opportunity of seeing a crop circle be informed? No, unfortunately, I haven't. But I have been lucky enough mm -hmm. to be the first person to go into a formation. And the one I'm particularly thinking about was a little one in Yorkshire. And it's just a tiny little one with a standing center to it. And all I can tell you, it was in, it was in um, immature wheat. Mm. And the crop still had that wonderful um, gray bloom to, to the stalks, which is part of the natural growing process. And the great bloom still on the stalks. And I just looked at it and I couldn't go into it. It seemed to be a sacred place to me. It was so, so beautiful that I felt even if I saw in there, all I could do was just look at it and, and take photographs. It was utterly beautiful. And this is one of the ways in which you can distinguish if a crop circle is genuine or not, that this particular time of growth, stage of growth, mm -hmm. because as I was mentioning, 
in the uh, young barley and the, particularly in the young winter wheat, which is a uh, very dark green, it has this gray film um, running up along the stems. Now, if any weight is applied, such as feet or a sporting board, that is going to take away or leave marks on this green film, gray film. And you only have to just take a, a stalk and run your finger up along the stem and the gray uh, film disappears. So there are all sorts of ways of um, analyzing uh, or quantifying um, crop circles uh, at different stages of their appearance. Interesting. Uh, what about any uh, traces of maybe radiation or any electromagnetic anomalies? Well, uh, several people have um, have had radio, um, radio, radio well, radiation meters, and I had one on here, which I, I haven't used. I did use it quite a lot uh, at one time, but I mm -hmm. seem to have so much research to do mm -hmm. uh, that it's hard to carry all this equipment with me. There was one circle in Wiltshire, and I can't remember when it was. It was way back, maybe in sort of 7, uh, 95, 96, a long way back. Uh, and suddenly my meter went into the red area. Now, the red area is in the danger area of radiation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my goodness, wow, what's happening? And then it went off. So I walked backwards to try and establish where this point of uh, radiation had been, and I couldn't find it again, so I think it must have been what's called cosmic uh, radiation. It was most extraordinary. Yes. <clears throat> what about uh, quartz crystals? Has anyone brought any quartz crystals into any of the crop circles? Oh, oh yes. Frequently. Mm -hmm. Because crop circles will take on the uh, energy of, well, the residual energy of the force. And what we, we haven't actually discussed is uh, one question which I get asked frequently, where does this force originate? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't really know. I mean, it is a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, you should have a scientific basis for any hypothesis. Right. And it was Dr. Terence Meaden, who, a meteorologist, who uh, suggested that the uh, originating area could be the ionosphere. Uh, which is an area of huge atmospheric electricity. So what we're dealing with is an electric force that comes spiraling down to Earth in a, a plasma vortex, and that is electrically charged particles. Mm -hmm. And it hits the ground, it's been estimated, with hundreds of thousands of volts per meter, but only for uh, a nanosecond, otherwise you would find, well, the crop would be burnt. And very occasionally, we do find evidence of scorched crop, fallen crop. What then happens is that there, it seems to be a microwave effect that the crop is bent over at the base. It seems to be just softened at the base, and the force then travels up the interior of the stem, and as it goes up, it breaks down the molecular structure in the stem. And there have been many, many uh, experiments on this. Dr. Levengood in, in uh, the States has done a lot of work on this. Right. Okay. Now, I want to touch upon um, the issue about um, with crop circles and the association, or in this case, possible association, with how they're being formed. We do know that there have been hoaxers out there who have created these uh, crop circles. Um, in your opinion, what could be creating these crop circles? And I'm thinking in the line of either extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings, or possibly orbs. Right. Well, now, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> it is. That's one of the ineffable ones. And, yeah. And this is, this, is where, this is where we find it such a fascinating and, and, and <laughs> all-consuming mystery because 
when I was little, I, I think um, I must have been a horrendous child. I was, mm-hmm. I was like the elephant child, Roger Kipling's elephant child. I was, mm-hmm. I was always asking questions. Right. It must have been pretty poisonous. And, um, and my first quest was the Loch Ness Monster. Mm-hmm. What about the Loch I mean, I just found that all totally self-absorbing. And um, then my next one was the, the uh, theory of relativity. I found that ex- fantastic. And then my, I suppose my, my latest, my one that actually took me right up into the crop circles was with infinity. I, I could never quite understand how some, it, it could be actually infinite. It surely had to be finite at some point. Infinity had to be finite. Well, of course, that's a total contradiction because infinity is infinity. And um, it wasn't until I came into the crop circle phenomenon and I longed, longed, longed to find the progenitor, if you like, or the origin of the, or the being or the intelligence behind it that, that uh, I suddenly realized after maybe five years that I was never going to. And suddenly, suddenly I became quite comfortable with the fact and I became quite comfortable with infinity. I asked me to accept that I couldn't always find the answer to everything and that there had to be certain things that were going to be probably forever mm-hmm. beyond any solution that I could find. Mm-hmm. And I, I really relaxed then and, and I thought, well, now, is this absolutely fundamentally important? And I thought to myself, no, it isn't. I think my research is fundamentally important because what I'm doing is is developing along certain areas, which we'll discuss later on. But I know many people, uh, they still strive after this. And what we do know, as I was describing to you just now, is the fact that um, they are, uh, well, they are created by uh, natural forces. But we have to say... Uh, who is the guiding hand, or what is the master hand? Yes, because uh, behind behind the natural forces. Yes, and <laughs> this is again the, the big question, mm-hmm. and and I think there might be many different answers. Again, it's rather like uh, what is the interpretation of of the crop circles? Uh, again, there could be many different answers to this, and. Um, my particular answer is that I, I think there is definitely an intelligence. Mm-hmm. What that intelligence is, I simply don't know. You know, I um, the reason why I'm asking this question is because I've uh, read of some reports of orb activity in and around the tour at Glastonbury. So I'm I'm somewhat speculating that the same activity could be occurring out there in the wheat fields, that there is a higher intelligence of which we're not yet familiar with that could be um, creating these crop circles. Well, I think I think you are right, certainly in part, mm-hmm. because um, I think certain certain orbs um, as we like to call them, possibly luminosities, have uh, intelligence behind them, and they move in an intelligent way. There have been reports by hoaxers mm-hmm. trying to make a crop circle, and, and orbs, have, orbs have appeared, and the orb has followed them wherever they go, and they've been so terrified mm-hmm. <laughs> that they've taken to their heels and they've fled. Right. Um, but, and also, when I was in Taos, uh, New Mexico, 18 months ago, giving a talk at the Labyrinth Society, which is simply wonderful. Um, of course, it's an area of huge um, North American, well, uh, American Indian activity. And um, they design um, a labyrinth in sacred places. Mm-hmm. You know, they know how to die, they know, they, they know how to use the natural forces. And uh, uh, one of the North American Indians um, he designed one uh, for us, for the Labyrinth Society. And we went there, this was in the evening, and we all helped construct it. It was just wonderful, and he'd laid down the skeleton of it. And then we put little 
little um, uh, brown paper bags with sand in them and lighted candles in them. Oh, it's just wonderful. And several of us took photographs. And we all had absolutely extraordinary orbs appearing in our photographs. Uh, some had a sort of cellular structure to them, as so though without doubt there was some intelligence behind in, in these orbs. And when I spoke to Akta, the, the North American Indian, I, I said to an actor, how, what, how do you describe, what, what, what are these orbs? What do they mean to you? And he said, oh, those are the spirits of my ancestors. Hmm. But you see, that's another lovely interpretation. And absolutely right. I mean, to him, they were spirits of his ancestors. So here we're getting this energy, whatever you like to call it, it's an energy. And we're dealing, this is what we're dealing with, right side this phenomenon, we're dealing with energies and frequencies. Mm-hmm. Well, now, what would you say in all the years of research into crop circles was the most astounding discovery so far, according to you? Ah, well, I can answer that very, very easily. Mm-hmm. That is the research that I am currently focusing on, which is the temporary relief of Parkinson's disease. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody will know about Parkinson's. It's, it's, a, it's a condition where very often people shake uh, uncontrollably. It, it can have other, other sort of appearances. There is no particular known cause. It might be genetic. It might be due to a virus. It might be due to a trauma. It could have multiple uh, causes, uh, but whatever the cause is, it is a most um, well. It's a, it's a most unfortunate, debilitating, uh, basically incurable condition. And um, a very famous favorite cousin of mine, who was an absolutely brilliant scientist, he died of it four years ago. He happened to be a Buddhist, Buddhist so he was extraordinarily philosophical about his degeneration, and he was just amazing. Um, But in 1997, we're going back a little bit here, we're going back uh, over over 20 years, Mm -hmm. Uh, a friend of mine, we'll just call her Mary, um, she had Parkinson's, and in fact I saw her two weeks ago, um, and she's getting increasingly uh, incapacitated. she was desperate to try an alternative form of medicine opposed, as opposed to the orthodox. And she said she would love to go into a crop circle. So I said, yes, yes, I, I see no why, what reason why you shouldn't, but it has to be at your own risk because uh, not everybody feels well inside a crop circle. And maybe... Uh, the next time we do an interview, we can go over the different categories um, of what happens to people. Um, so she said, yes, I, I'll accept that, that it'll be my own responsibility. So I said, well, that's fine, and I will try and find uh, a crop circle that is as um, largely beneficial as possible. So in 1997, one appeared at Alton Priors near Marlborough in Wiltshire. And I spent a week down there, and I went into it every day. I felt absolutely fine. And I would stand at the edge of the field, and I would talk to people as they came out. And there wasn't a single person who had any adverse effects. So I said to Mary, I think this could be the one for you to visit. So several days later, she came down with a friend, and they sat in the center for approximately 20 minutes. And to her absolute amazement, her shaking stopped for 24 hours. Now, for somebody who was shaking so many times per second, uh, let alone a minute or an hour, to stop shaking for 24 hours was quite outside any realm of of, of a hope that she had, she had even considered. And she said it wasn't just the relief from shaking. She said it was the extraordinary 
feeling of well-being that went along with this. And so, despite all the setbacks that one experiences during scientific work, and sometimes the total lack of progress, and you think, why am I doing this? Why am I continuing? Because I'm not really getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. The very fact that this has happened to Mary has kept me going. And we've been doing tests, we've been doing brain tests, EEG tests, for many years, but only going up as far as the beta level of brain activity. Now, we have several levels of, levels of brain activity, going from the delta, which is 0.0 to point, well, 0.5 um, to uh, 0.5 to, uh, yes, 0.0 to 0.5. Then we have theta, which is 0.5 to 3. Then we have alpha, which is 3 to 8. Um, beta, which is 8 to 13. No, wait a second, I've got this wrong. So it's, um, well, it's 8 to 13. Um, beta is 8 to 13. So, wait a second, I've got, sorry, I've got this completely wrong. It's 13 to 30. Mm -hmm. And then you come on to gamma. You get low gamma, high gamma. Then you get on to more lambda and all the rest. Well, we've only got as far as beta. Mm -hmm. And then three years ago, I think it was, we, uh, we suddenly had a machine which went up into the gamma level. And what was happening was that we were finding people who were actually showing huge spikes of the increase in the level of gamma. Well, I really had no idea what was happening in the gamma, so I did a huge amount of research on the Internet. And in one little article, way, way down at the bottom, I found that a little thing saying, uh, uh, in the gamma state of brain activity, the brain naturally uh, produces dopamine. Now, dopamine is the chemical that the majority of Parkinson sufferers uh, don't have. So they're given the synthetic brain neurotransmitter of dopamine in order to provide this. So suddenly, I had a handle on this, and I can't tell you how excited I was. So the next year, somebody came along called David Greenwood, who was a Parkinson's sufferer, and uh, he was shaking quite badly uh, beforehand. He had quite a lot of difficulty walking into the circle, but once he was in the circle, suddenly he found that all his shaking had disappeared. Mm. And when he came out of the circle, we were walking along the road in order to do a con double control test. Because what we do, we start off by doing control tests at the Avebury Study Centre, which is in Avebury, which is a long, long way away from any circle. We then decide which circle we're going to go into. We repeat the tests. And then after that, we walk way away from the circle again, and we do double control tests to see how people have been affected whilst inside the circle, and then the three tests are compared and analyzed. Well, after being in the circle, I was walking along the road and somebody came up walking very fast behind me, and who should it be but David Greenwood? Mm. Well, I couldn't believe this, and nor could he. This was not the shuffling man who'd been with me at the beginning of the day. And in fact, um, again, he... Um, it this continued for some time, but unfortunately, the shaking came back when he was driving home. Now, the last year, we took in somebody called Jill Puttick, and again, she had remarkable cessation of, of shaking while she was inside, but again, it was temporary. Now, I happened to talk to a, a scientist in the Midlands, and <laughs> it's quite difficult talking to scientists because when they hear the word crop circles, mm -hmm. they immediately think that you're a nutcase. Right. And, and this is very difficult to get over. And so I quickly have to tell them what I'm doing and suddenly I find them listening. And this particular scientist said, well, now this is very, very fascinating, the work you, that you're doing, because we're finding that if we raise people into the gamma level of brain activity, which is, uh, as I was saying, uh, 38 to 72, 
He said it seems to inhibit the dyskinesia. In other words, it stops the shaking. Mm -hmm. So this is, yes, this, as you were asking, is my particular area of research. And if anybody would like to donate to this particular area of research, because so many people are afflicted by this desperate condition, uh, they can go onto my website and I've got a link to PayPal. I, I would be quite uh, enormously um, grateful because it, it would mean an awful lot to me because I just feel that if um, the crop circles can in any way um, contribute to this area of research, that would be testimony to their, to their existence. One, one of the areas it would be tes testimony to their very existence. And, and let's just go through the, that range again. Delta was 0.5 to 4 hertz. Theta is 4 hertz to 8. Alpha is 8 hertz to 14. Beta 14 to 30. And then uh, the gamma 30 to, well, 30 to 52 is low gamma, and 52 to uh, 72 um, is, is high gamma. Mm -hmm. And then, as I say, you go into to Mu and Lambda. Right. But uh, this is an area, yes, which I, I think has profound possibilities to it. And and I had a clinical physiologist with me last year who um, works at the Devon and Exeter Hospital. And he does a lot of work with uh, people who've got scoliosis, which is a curvature of the spine, mm -hmm. and people with encephalitis, which is water on the, on the brain. And his particular purpose of this is when they are being operated on, he wires them up with these various electrodes so that if the, if the doctors, if the surgeons are getting anywhere near any danger point, you know, with nervous systems and around the spinal cord, he can warn them ahead of time. He's an absolutely essential member of the team. And he was with us last year doing tests. Uh, but we can talk further about that in, in, in our next Next, oh, yeah. Uh, interview. Next, second hour. Now, I want to point one thing out uh, to any of our listeners. Crop circles have been discovered throughout the world, not just necessarily in, in the UK. But I want to ask you this, Lucy. Why England? Why is England considered the central hub for these fascinating circles, these crop circles? Um, ah, the nexus. The nexus. Exactly. Well, they take. We're a sacred Isle of Albion, you mustn't forget that. Mm -hmm. And we're a very, very small uh, area com com compared to America or Australia. Right. And we have a huge amount of energy lines, or some people call them ley lines. Mm -hmm. Now, they just don't appear in England. They appear all over the world. There's a network of these lines. And they move and they contract and they uh, open up, <coughs> expand <coughs> according to the movement of the tectonic plates mm -hmm. uh, in, in the on the planet. Right. And I would maybe suggest that uh, in England we have um, an abundance of these um, energy lines and all genuine crop circles appear on energy lines and also Geophysical uh, surveys have been conducted, which show that 98.3%, I think it is, all appear on clay. Now, the reason for this, and again, we'll talk more about this in the second half of exactly. this interview, mm -hmm. uh, that water is absolutely um, an essential part to the general appearance of crop circles because it is the electromagnetic force um, emanating from the crop circles which mixes with the descending electrical force. <coughs> Interesting. Um, and in fact, when I was in the States and giving a lecture several years ago, I spoke to one of the American researchers, and I said, have you done any particular research in this area? And he said, oh, yes, we had. And he said, our results are the same, but he said the majority of uh, crop circles appear on limestone. Now, that has exactly the same quality as clay, 
mm-hmm. which has its permeable permeal uh, uh, quality to it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, Lucy, we are approaching the end of the first hour here. Uh, would you care to remind our listeners of your website and where they can find your books and calendars you you produced? Yes, anybody who would like to visit my website, please go on. Mm -hmm. I also have a link where you can become a member. Mm -hmm. It's totally free. Mm -hmm. And when I have the time, I send out um, letters uh, if anything exciting has happened Mm -hmm. or if I've been visiting something um, and and an extraordinary thing has happened to me. Anyhow, it's just a sort of a link to to me. And um, you also on my website, you'll be able to see my... um, Crop Circle Library, you'll be able to read my articles. I think I, I counted the other day, I think there are 33 articles that I've got up on my website. My latest one is called A New Beginning. Mm-hmm. Yes, I see that here. Uh, which I felt was opposite, you know, it, it was the, with the Mayan calendar and, and, and the Mayan was basically the, the sort of, well, I felt that it was a new beginning after the, after the uh, 1212. Mm-hmm. It just seemed to me to be I think I, I, I'm a very positive person. I'm, I'm born with a person with my glass half full. Mm-hmm. And I just feel that we are entering an age of a new beginning when we... Even, things aren't going to be solved overnight. I think we've got to realize that this is going to be a slow process, but it's an upward process. And in fact, when I was in um, New Mexico, uh, there was a wonderful and venerable uh, Toltec uh, Indian and um, he was questioned about the uh, 1212, the Mayan calendar, the, basically the end. And he said, well, the shift has started in 1947. And I, and I looked that up, and I think that was the year when it was an American who first broke the speed of sound, and also was the year of Roswell. Yes. And he was not in the slightest bit prepared. He said, it will all slowly go back to normal. So therefore, this is what we've got to focus on. Mm -hmm. Things may not happen all at once, but things are going to get better. We've got to be positive. The more positive we are, the better it's going to be. And so that's why it's called A New Beginning. And as well as that, I've got all my merchandise. So please, please come on. And if you want to buy any of my books, I'll happily sign them for you or uh, whatever you want to buy. Sounds like a wonderful deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the web, website, should I give it eyes? Is yes. www, you don't have to put that. If you just go on to Lucy Pringle, or one word, uh, .co .uk. Okay. That will take you to my website. Awesome, Lucy. Well, I really appreciate the time you've taken here to discuss your fascinating research on crop well, it's circles. a fascinating subject, isn't it? I mean, it can, mm-hmm. it's deep, profound, and, and endless. That's it for the first hour on As Above, So Below Radio. Tune in for the second hour by subscribing to HolisticAdvocate.com, where Lucy will share her insights on the possible language hidden within crop circles. Is there a hidden language buried within? That Julia said, and why this crop circle aroused so much attention? the controversial alien image that appeared in 2002, and the possible connection to crop circles and ley lines, and so much more.
You're listening to As Above, Soul Below Radio.